Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us. Sorry for uh, the delay. We had a technical difficulty, but right now uh, everything is running smoothly apparently. Uh, we're gonna give everyone a quick minute uh, to start uh, before we start. So give us another minute for everyone to join in and then we start. Okay, let's start. Hello and uh, welcome everybody to the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy's running series on the current landscape of Sino-American relations, where we uh, look to shed light on the challenges and opportunities for the US and Chinese bilateral relationship in the 21st century that's increasingly uh, defined by multipolarity and the specter of great power politics. My name is Bijan Ahmadi, and I'm the executive director of the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy, a nonpartisan think tank committed to promoting and amplifying innovative thinking in North Atlantic foreign policy. We stand for dialogue, diplomacy, prudent realism, and restraint, principles which we believe are the four cornerstones of sustainable peace in an increasingly complex and dynamic international system. So far in this series, we have explored the nature of US-China relations from the perspective of policymakers in Washington, as well as in Beijing, focusing on the nexus between the evolving strategic context and geopolitical realities and the shifting perceptions among national security establishment in these two countries. Additionally, we have been examining the place and role of the many smaller countries, middle powers, as they pondered their position between these two great powers. Today, we'll be discussing the digital great game and the technological frontier in the context of US-China strategic competition. What are the geopolitical incentives behind increasing competition in the technological domain? And what, the role, what role does such technological race play in the strategic calculus of Washington and Beijing and in the possibility for escalation and conflict? How will the evolving dynamic between Beijing and Washington color the nature of issues like cybersecurity, intellectual property protection, artificial intelligence, and 5G? Can these two nations constructively work together in areas of common interest, or is their rivalry going to impact every aspect of technological innovation in the near future? Here to bring us insight on these and many more related issues are our distinguished panelists. Our moderator, Rebecca um, Fannin, is a leading tech and innovation journalist, having written for CNBC and Forbes. Uh, she's the founder of Silicon Dragon Ventures and author of Tech Titans of China. I leave it for uh, Rebecca to introduce the other panelists. Before we start, a quick reminder that all our China discussions are also live streamed on YouTube and a recording of each will be available on our YouTube channel. So I encourage you all to subscribe to the YouTube channel uh, to uh, both uh, watch these discussions and also receive updates about future panel discussions. Rebecca, thanks for being with us today. The floor is yours, please go ahead. All right, well, thank you for the invitation to moderate this panel. I'm glad to be here. We're streaming to you from Silicon Valley, uh, from Washington, DC, uh, and from the Netherlands. So uh, we've got, um, a lot of bases covered here. So uh, let me uh, just uh, introduce the panelists. Uh, we will be going in alphabetical order by their last name. So first up is Roger Kramers, co-founder of DigiChina. And he is an assistant professor at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. Uh, so hello, Roger. Uh, next mm -hmm. is Paul Triolo, managing director, global tech policy, at the Eurasia Group in Washington, DC. Hello, Paul. And Steve Weber, a professor at UC Berkeley, uh, also faculty director of the Berkeley Center for 
uh, long-term cybersecurity security. Uh, so hello, Steve. So what we were going to be doing is uh, starting out with uh, a few minutes, seven to eight minutes of discussion or uh, presentation by each one of these panelists. And uh, we are also going to be taking Q&A from the audience, from the online audience. So if you have a question, uh, you can write it in to this Q&A box here and we will be monitoring it and um, getting to the best question. Uh, so make sure your question is a good one. Uh, so we have um, until uh, 1245 uh, West Coast time. I'm chiming in here from Silicon Valley, so I'm, I'm on West Coast time. Uh, so why don't we start then with uh, Roger. Uh, Roger, um, are you ready? Yes, I am. Uh, how, um, thank you very much uh, for having me on. Uh, I'm Roger Quimmers, and uh, as Rebecca already very kindly said, I spend a lot of my time working on uh, Chinese technology issues, uh, both in terms of domestic governance, how does the Chinese government use technology in order to govern, in order to enhance its ability to, um, to govern social, economic, and political processes, but also internationally, how it does China's growing footprint in global cyberspace influence uh, all of us? Um, and obviously I've learned a lot about that, but there's also something that I've learned and that is, I think perhaps very important with regard to the question that we're discussing here today. And that is telling that story to Western audiences who in very many ways fundamentally lack a basis for that story to be told. Um, and this is, uh, this is very much where I would like uh, to start today. Because, you know, as is very clear, um, there are very many points of potential conflict or points of potential tension, or competition uh, between the West and China, and in particular between the US and China, um, right? This is also something where we shouldn't too easily uh, assume that the West is the United States and anyone sort of peddling along in its wake. I'd like to think of that in Europe, we have a little bit of geopolitical independence left. Um, but um, I think it's very clear that in this tension, there are obviously conflicts of values. There are obviously conflict of hard interests, hard economic interests, hard security interests, hard geopolitical interests. But I think if I were to ask the question, what kind of challenge China actually represent? I would say, first of all, and before we can discuss seriously any other aspect, China is an intellectual challenge. Because what China's growing success in technology presents us with here in the West is a world that we never believe could exist. And even as it unfolds itself right in front of us, we seem to find it exceedingly difficult or even impossible to grapple with its consequences. Now, why is that? Uh, a lot of this, again, it has to do with storytelling. Human beings live in stories. You know, we use st stories to structure the way around us. And the story that we in the West have been telling ourselves, particularly since the end of the Cold War, is we won. We won the Cold War, and this proves the superiority of our system. It proves that the only way in which a country can exist successfully and sustainably and should exist morally is the combination of liberal democracy plus free market capitalism. And this is what we ended up believing. This is what we started living out at home. And technology really came to symbolize that. You know, when we talk about Silicon Valley today, when we talk about the tech industry, it's really that combination of the triumph of the private sector, even though that could be heavily criticized, for instance, by people like Mariana Mazzucato, and uh, you know, the fact that this brings, this enhances liberal democracy, right? Technology is about free speech. It's also about bringing the light of free speech, free association information to the dark corners of the world. 
because that fits within that post-Cold War narrative where, you know, we in the West, who are we? What do we do? We beat dictators. And we did it in Germany. We did it with the USSR. And with Tiananmen, essentially, we led ourselves to believe that we were going to do the same in China, or at least that it would only be a matter of time before communist governance followed uh, com the Communist Party of China, follow the Communist Party of the Soviet Union into the dustbin of history. So for pretty much three decades, we've been trying to figure out when, uh, trying to figure out how China would democratize. And that's created an enormous blind spot in the sense that we've not paid attention seriously to what is actually going on in China in terms of governance. And exactly because we believe that only liberal democracies uh, can be both policy competent and morally good, you know, I'm not going to be dragged into a whole discussion about the morality of the Chinese government, but I will say that in terms of policy competence, they are far more competent than we give them credit for. Uh, and we overlook their competence to our detriment, right? We believe that China can only be successful if it cheats. And I think, you know, clearly uh, there has been, uh, there, has, there have been significant efforts from the Chinese side to acquire technology from abroad. This is what rising powers do, and I would invite anyone to take a look at US industrial history in the second half of, of the 19th century, when exactly the same happened, only on a slightly smaller scale because we didn't really have broadband connections that can funnel terabytes of data halfway across the globe in seconds. Um, so, what we need, uh, so what we are now confronted with is the fact that uh, that naive, wonderful, tranquil post-Cold War period is coming to an end. Uh, or to put it in sort of, uh, you know, slightly uh, clickbaity um, political science terms, we're coming to the end of the end of history. We are now entering the post-post-Cold War period. Um, and that, in the same way that the post-Cold War period was characterized by our view of technology, this new period is characterized by the hangover of that view of technology. Um, it's safe to say that both in the US and in Europe, and I would argue the crackdown we are seeing in China against the private sector is also part of that global movement. But I think we can safely say that we're done with big tech in the way that it exists at present. And in Europe, we're moving in fairly strongly to regulate. Just look at GDPR. A couple of years ago, there's now the Digital Services, Digital Markets Act uh, working its way through parliament. There's been a whole bunch of stuff on online consumer protection. Um, I fully expect some degree of uh, antitrust regulation uh, amongst others. And obviously the whole debate about section 230 to come in the US as well. And that is partially because <coughs> After this post-Cold War party that we had, we're now hungover. We got drunk on technology. Um, and now we've started to see that that techno-optimism was misplaced. And China and technologies really become part of that story as well, where suddenly digital technology is something to fear because it turns out that this big bad adversary that, that China of which we cannot even understand that it still exists because surely it should have democratized by now, wields. And so from our own refusal to engage with the complexity of that world, suddenly we have this boogeyman sort of running up at us uh, from the shadows uh, of the loopholes in our own narratives. And where I would like to conclude is this, China has never been so naive. And this is something that we really need to take into consideration. In our techno-optimism during that post-Cold War period, we have not addressed a whole bunch of policy questions that we really should have asked with regard to technology. China has, you know, how do you, how do you actually govern content at a point in time where the content space is no longer characterized by scarcity, but by abundance? And it has done that for numerous very thorny questions. And I will be the first to say that one doesn't need to agree with the answers that China gave to them. Personally, I don't. But at the same time, I would argue that the fact that they did puts them in a very strong position 
to navigate the fairly perilous uh, or, or the, 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 fairy, the fairly murky trajectory of technology to come. And here I would like to give an example. When people like you and me talk about data protection, all we talk about is personal data protection. That's all there is. It's about individual privacy, as you call it in the United States. It's about individual fundamental rights, as we call it in Europe. It's pretty much the same with a different label. This is about people and the relationship to the state and their relationship to businesses. And then yes, we do have a little bit of a regulatory framework for classified government information, but that's pretty much it. A couple of weeks ago, the Chinese government passed or the Chinese National People's Congress passed the data security law. This is a law that will stand next to the personal information protection law, which will likely come out within a month or so. And it answers a very interesting question. How do we deal with those elements of data, whether it's personal data or any other kind of data, industrial data, uh, critical information infrastructure data, whatever kind of data, and the relationship between national security and the public interest? As far as I'm aware, China is the first and only major digital power in the world who has regulation on uh, that to have regulation on these issues on the books. We haven't even started to ask the question on how we might deal with the question. And that means that, I mean, I'm, I'm one of these people who is fairly skeptical whenever we talk about a race, quote unquote, with China, in very many ways, it really isn't, you know. However, China regulates particular domestic processes as no bearing on how we do that. You know, there is no explicit link there to me. But what I would say is that certainly from a European perspective where the EU likes to see itself as a regulatory superpower, one has to recognize that on a lot of these issues, China is the only game in town. And that will put it in a very powerful position uh, in, turn of, in, in terms of influencing decision-making in other, other governments. And it may also put it in a first mover position the moment that it comes to global governance on these issues. So my big takeaway from having researched Chinese technology for over a decade now, but particularly talking to Western policymakers and audiences is, we need to get our own house in order and quickly. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Well, that was wonderful. I just would like to follow up with the question uh, that you raised about China being ahead on this regulatory front. Do you think that the Western governments wish that they could do the same sort of uh, regulation that China has now or is doing now? I'm not sure. Part of the problem is that governments in the West have sort of gotten themselves into a hands-off mode of thinking. Certainly in the Netherlands, we see that a lot, but we see it across Europe and, and certainly the United States has some of it where, you know, the moment we, we seem to have gotten a point where we say there is a system, the economy, and that system works in one particular way that really cannot be influenced that much by politics. So really the task of governments is to attend to the needs of that system rather than try to uh, at least mold the parameters within, that, within which that system can operate. And so I think we have a generation of politicians now for whom evasion of accountability has become core to their modus operandi. Um, and so I frankly, I think that there are many legislators many, uh, many uh, members in executive, uh, in, in executive branches across Europe uh, and, and more broadly the Western world, they're just scared because they are asked to do something that they've never had to do before in their, you know, in that sense, relatively cushy existence. Mm -hmm. Interesting, very interesting. Um, thank you very much, uh, Roger. Well, let's move on uh, to Paul Triolo from the Eurasia Group. Uh, Paul. Thank you. And Roger, we, uh, Roger we, we call that regulatory lag in, in my world, the, <laughs> the idea that regulators think of there. So um, if you'll notice, Roger got through the whole thing without mentioning any company names. <laughs> so in my world, um, where we are, we are a geopolitical risk consultancy, and um, many of our clients are major players in this uh, arena that we're talking about here. Um, just about any large technology company you can think of. We do not have clients in China though, uh, for, for complicated reasons. Um, but we are dealing with these issues sort of at a 
you know, a fairly, a little bit below the, the level that Roger very nicely laid out in terms of sort of the, the bigger picture uh, here in terms of where the US and China are or the US or China and the Western world. So I think um, when we talk to clients, of course, we, we're talking about sort of really nitty gritty things like, you know, how is this or that export control gonna affect their uh, supply chain <laughs> um, in the next, you know, in the next month or maybe the next three to five years, uh, if we extrapolate out some of the political risks um, around, um, for example, US-China relations and Taiwan. Um, so I think if we just step back quickly on, to, to, I think Roger laid out sort of the bigger picture, but I think in terms of sort of the, the where, we, where we are now and how we got here, I think it's important to just touch on a couple of, couple of key issues. First of all, um, you know, the, 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 this tech, tech, US-China tech cold war is, as I have called it, I started tweeting this in, in uh, January of 2019. Uh, it turned out that my good friend, Paul Moser at the New York Times had coined that term several years before, but I did not know about that. And so we agreed that we were like scientists on either side of the Atlantic that had sort of come up with the same discovery um, at the same time. Uh, and so we, we uh, I, and I began using that largely because of the of the tech issues coming out of the trade talks, the U.S. China trade talks, which centered around things like market access in China, uh, forced technology transfer, um, subsidies uh, under under various Chinese government programs. So that that the, the, if you look at the language just in the in the Section 301 report that came out in 2018. Um, there's lots of tech, it's, it's all about technology. I mean, there are other issues around agriculture and subsidies and other things, but it basically focuses on technology. So, so what, what, what changed? Because this really wasn't under the Obama administration, we weren't really in this world. But what changed was uh, the accession, of course, of Xi Jinping in 2012. And then over the, over the course of, of five to six years, uh, the Chinese government rolling out a whole bunch of initiatives that sort of set off alarm bells in the West. And this includes Made in China 2025, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, the National IC Investment Fund, which former Commerce Secretary Penny Pritzker described as a plan to appropriate global supply chains for semiconductors. Um, and then things like the AI development strategy, um, which people still cite as China wanting to dominate AI by 2030, which we can, we can talk about, but I think is sort of an absurd proposition. I talked to the drafters of that six months after that, and they admitted that most of it was already overtaken by events. Um, so very aspirational. But a lot of these things, aspirational as they may be, ended up setting off alarm bells um, or furthering uh, concerns that, uh, uh, that were of long standing. And then you throw in things like military civ fusion, which, uh, which Roger knows, knows quite a bit about, um, the idea that somehow uh, the Chinese military is leveraging every uh, gain in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the civilian sector for military gain, which of course they base on US, the US model. <laughs> um, you know, you throw that in and, and then you have a, a pretty, pretty rich stew of technology concerns. So what that means is out of that come, come these memes that have, that have grown to be part of what people uh, call the Washington consensus, which, which evolved in the last particularly two years of the Trump administration and have continued very much intact into the Biden era. And these are things like, okay, well, there's, there's um, uh, China's industrial policy gives it advan its, its companies advantages, an unfair advantage, and the U.S. needs a similar approach in some key sectors. So we've already seen, of course, the Biden administration embark on uh, an industrial policy light, you could argue, and of course, the EU and, and others are sort of uh, all, all talking about more industrial policy in the tech sector. There, there's other, another meme, which is that there's too heavy dependence on China for supply chains, um, like rare earths and Semiconductors is more complicated, but there, there, there's still this perception that supply chains centered on China, EV batteries is a good example, are a national security concern. So there's, there, there's over-dependence on China. And so there, there's a big effort now, again, under the Biden administration, but starting in the Trump era, to deleverage uh, US dependence uh, on supply chains that originate in China. And, but I think there's a couple more memes that are really, that, 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 are, that are much more sort of long, you know, deep and probably gonna, are gonna last you know, much longer than the Biden administration. One is that there's a long-term struggle for these key technologies we're talking about here, like AI, 5G, quantum computing. Um, and critically though, that China is misusing these technologies or more willing to misuse these technologies in the, in the, in the uh, support of government surveillance um, uh, or um, you know, exporting these technologies globally for other governments to, 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 so these can be used nefariously. So that, that's a huge, uh, a huge issue. Techno-authoritarianism, for example, that's what the media used. And then finally, the other issue is, goes back to the sort of civil fusion, which is that China's leveraging US technology and has taken advantage of US and other Western technology 
um, the openness of markets in the West to, to, um, for military gain. And, 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 and this to a large degree accounts for China's um, military modernization, um, which is a, obviously a huge concern. Uh, when I first started following China 30 years ago, China's military was sort of a joke um, and um, you know, was, was largely using outdated equipment. And, and, and so in, in the course of my, in my career, I've seen China go from sort of, you know, can't do anything right, either in a technology side or, or in, the, in the military side, except for maybe nuclear weapons and, 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 and transcontinental missiles to, go, to being sort of 800 pound gorilla. So as Roger said, I think that part of the problem is, is that there's, th this is a complicated picture. In some areas, yes, there are truths to some of these memes, for example, but in, but in other areas, one could argue, for example, that the US has overreacted to Made in China 2025, right? If you look at the actual, uh, if you look at actual, you know, where China is on semiconductors, um, based on, based uh, compared to where they aspired to be in Made in China 2025 documents, there's a huge gap. For example, <laughs> I mean, a, a, a yawning gap. Um, so, in any case, what what um, you wanted to get quickly, we wanted to get into the 5G area. So that's an area that we obviously do a lot in um, because it's sort of the poster boy for some of these things, right? Because a lot of the concerns around cybersecurity, et cetera, national security have centered on on Huawei and 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 the the uh, the, the Chinese company's uh, major role in in 5G. G rollouts. Um, and so I think, um, you know, this, this is something, again, that sort of evolved over time, it, but it, it's, it's an important part of the equation because I think, you know, Huawei and ZTE have been of concern for a long time in the U.S. and Congress going back to 2012, but I think 5G, the sort of dawn of the 5G era or the imminent dawn of the 5G era sort of crystallized a lot of concerns around Huawei, partly because of the data issue and the idea that, for example, you know, large amounts of Western data, the lifeblood of Western democracies would be traversing uh, Huawei equipment around the world and people People had a lot of lot of lot of issues with that, and so so we saw that uh, we saw that five G issue become you know hugely uh, of, of huge importance in the, in 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 the, in the, the the Trump era, and particularly there were two major events here that, that I think are important to unpack a, a bit and look at the their impact in the geopolitical. Uh, issues around them. One is the May 19, May 2019 Huawei uh, entity list action taken by the Commerce Department, which kind of came out of a, a little bit out of nowhere, um, and it came in the wake of the the, the collapse or the, the failure of the U.S.-China trade talks, which had been looking pretty promising up until uh, up until May of 2019. Um, and then the second event, though, which I think is even more important, is in May of 2020, the inclusion of uh, Huawei uh, uh, on, and, and the expansion of, of U.S. export controls through the so-called foreign direct product rule to basically say any company in the world anywhere that is using US technology to produce semiconductors on behalf of Huawei needs to get a license. So this, is, this was a, a very unprecedented expansion of US uh, export controls and the sort of weaponization of supply chains around semiconductor manufacturing equipment um, as part of this broader US-China tech conflict. And it has a lot of really, really important implications um, because it really, um, it, it disrupted supply chains in, in that sector. Um, it probably contributed to the global chip shortage. If you talk to industry people, for example, um, you, you, the figure is usually 10 to 15% of the global chip shortage can be attributed just to that action against Huawei. I think it may be larger because it changed the thinking among procurement officials at big companies and particularly in China uh, and, and made them more willing to stockpile semiconductors. Um, and that, that contributed to the, to the lack of capacity that, uh, that ended up uh, sort of coming together in the midst of the pandemic uh, for a lot of other reasons, but it certainly contributed to it. But the, one of the most important other, other aspects is that um, it's drawn Taiwan into the, into the US-China conflict in a much more sort of visceral way. Um, and uh, we are very concerned, for example, at Eurasia Group about the sort of tail risk of, um, of this of Taiwan and China and the US uh, that, that sort of delicate balance politically being being upset by the tech that some of these tech issues and so um, if you think about sitting in Beijing and your your number one company it's like an at the Apple of the Apple and the Google of China combined being cut off from producing advanced semiconductors in a province you consider part of China um, you get a sense of sort of where of, of, of the potential <laughs> uh, geopolitical uh, risk around this issue. And so um, in addition to Huawei, uh, in, uh, in early in the Biden administration, sort of continuing this concern about Chinese uh, tech uh, modernization and military modernization, the, the Biden administration put a Chinese company called Phytium on the entity list. Now, Phytium manufactures uh, CPUs, 
in Taiwan at a very advanced level and uses them in high performance computers in China that happen to model military systems like uh, 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 hypersonic missiles and weapons of mass destruction. So there's a lot of talk in DC now, for example, about extending that extraterritorial export control law to fight him, to cut them off from manufacturing uh, semiconductors in at TSMC. So what, what, we're, we're in what I call a sort of uh, a, 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 an unknown, an era of unknown red lines. So for example, in the US Taiwan relationship, there are a lot of known red lines, diplomatic uh, visits and arms sales to Taiwan, et cetera. But now we're in the technology domain where we don't know what the what Beijing's red line is in terms of, for example, cutting off more Chinese companies from being able to manufacture uh, semiconductors in Taiwan, which 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 of which there are many Chinese companies doing that. Um, but if you look at the logic behind the U.S. export control laws, for example, um, that th those could be extended. If again, if if it's a national security issue, um, then the question is, you know, what is the what what is the the the, the limits of, of this kind of export control? Part of the problem is that the export control system in the U.S., for example, was set up in the era of weapons of mass destruction, where the national security issue was very clear. So if you were shipping beryllium to Iran that could be used in a nuclear weapon, then you know, the, the industry was very e e capable of understanding that that was a concern. And usually these are very small companies. But in this era now, um, under the Trump administration and, and currently under the Biden administration, there has been no clear articulation of what is the national security issue here and how do you, how do you define uh, controls over, over technology in the era when the, these are all dual use technologies uh, and, China, and the real problem is China and China's technology rise. Um, that's, the, that's sort of the unstated national security concern here, but it's never been de defined in a way, for example, that industry can understand uh, this. Uh, we have clients, for example, who were cut off from supplying Huawei uh, and really were just supplying commodity semiconductors for, for a whole range of business lines in, in, uh, of Huawei. And, they, and the licensing process around that has been very chaotic and there's been not any guidance, for example, um, in the Trump era from the White House about what was actually the real concern and what, what, should, what should the licensing criteria be. Now, late in the Trump era, they finally came down that it was 5G. <laughs> so 5G, anything going to Huawei that could be used in 5G is bad. Um, but that's a hard, that, that definition is a little bit squishy too, right? Because it could be a semiconductor, a commodity semiconductor going to Huawei's enterprise business that's used in a cloud data center that's supporting a 5G network, right? So it's very murky and, and none of that has really been laid out in any, in any, uh, in any, uh, way, any clear way. So just finally, the, 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 where we're going here then is in, in the geopolitical realm is that this US-China tech confrontation here, um, particularly when it comes to things like semiconductors is headed into this very complicated and, 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 and potentially dangerous area where the US government is pushing hard on some of these things, uh, for example, in the export control arena without a really clear strategy around what the end goal is. Um, and this could push China into a corner. Uh, and so uh, if, if, if Taiwan was cut off, for example, from all uh, Chinese companies were cut off from Taiwan, all Chinese companies, and there's discussion of that in Washington, by the way, um, then you know, this pushes, this conceivably could push Beijing into a corner on Taiwan and take away some of the deterrent effect, for example, which Taiwan has, it, which is that both sides are very dependent on TSMC for their advanced semiconductors. Um, and TSMC is in a very unique situation. And that also has translated into this industrial policy uh, push, which I, I mentioned earlier, which there's a the growing recognition over the last two years because of these issues that there's too much dependence on, on TSMC. 92% of advanced semiconductors being manufactured in one place that's so geopolitically uh, fragile is not a good thing. And everybody recognizes that. The problem is that's a 10 year problem to solve. Um, by any by any reasonable stretch in terms of uh, just the money and the and the uh, and the sort of people and the technologies you, you would need to move out of Taiwan and put other places to 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 really diversify that those supply chains. So in any case, we're sort of at the cusp of of all these issues getting more complicated. 5G is definitely in the mix. We can talk more about the cybersecurity of 5G if you want. Um, but I think we're, we're at a really delicate point where the Biden administration still has not really articulated what its China strategy is other than to continue a lot of the policies that were started uh, in the Trump era. Um, and uh, there's a lot of concern that, that there's no clear commercial and trade, for example, agenda yet from the Biden team. Uh, and in the meantime, the technology stuff is sort of turning forward and creating some of some big geopolitical risks. Um, so let me stop there and happy to take questions and, and, and talk about these issues uh, in more depth as we go forward. Right, uh, Paul, that was great. Um, on, so in the 5G realm with Huawei, uh, does Huawei mm -hmm. really represent a genuine risk or is this part of the whole China tech cold war? 
uh, that's going on, that it's a pushback strategy against Huawei. What do you well, think? Well, it's a great question. It's a complicated issue. Um, I've written pretty a lot, a, lot, a lot on this. I think the bottom line is the Huawei became an obsession um, of the US government, you know, again, long before some of these issues I mentioned, long before Xi Jinping even um, uh, came, came to power. So it's hard to, dis what's hard to disentangle though is, you know, what is the US government's concern about Huawei? If, if you look at just, mm -hmm. for example, the entity list action, and you talk to people in the Trump administration, mm -hmm. you get seven different answers as to why they were put on the entity list, right? It was, was it around sanctions? Was it their bad business practices? Was it fear that they were dominating uh, unfairly the 5G uh, a marketplace. So certainly there are legitimate issues around, you know, vendors in, in, a, in a particular space. The issue though here is, you know, what is the, what, what, what are the risks and how to reduce the risk? So mm -hmm. I think basically there, there are two, two schools of thought here. One is that you can, you can reduce the risk in, in 5G networks, regardless of who the vendor is by cleverly uh, layering security. And this is the approach that the, that the UK has taken, um, the National Cybersecurity Center. I've had a lot of talks with them and they, they're putting in place a very strict law that, that mandates, um, you know, very strict security practices from the vendor, the operator, because again, Huawei is just a vendor. People, I've heard people say, talk about Huawei as if it was a carrier. It's not. It's a vendor. It's just supplying the equipment. The operator is responsible for, for really the overall net, the part, uh, operation of the network, not, not Huawei. Um, but because of 5G and the software nature of 5G, the cloud native uh, nature of 5G, there's a lot of concern because vendors do, will be doing a lot of software updates. But there's still lots of ways you can you can um, you can ma you can maintain the security or and reduce the risk, mitigate the risk um, through clever clever uh, requirements on both vendors and operators. So that's one school of thought. Then the U.S. school of thought and the sort of clean network, as we saw in the Trump era uh, and the Prague proposals, is basically you can't trust a vendor that's from China. I mean, the bottom line is then there is if the political and legal system in China are are, are uh, are, are taken into account, um, any vendor from China could be subject to Chinese law and, and required to turn over data. Uh, and so therefore you, can't, you have to have a zero trust <laughs> policy there. So there, those, two, those are the two, uh, the two ex you could argue sort of extremes in this. Um, and I guess I would come down uh, the, 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 um, the, on, on, with the sort of UK approach because it's very rigorous and, it, and it's, it's gonna provide security and 5G regardless of the vendor. And they actually started originally with the idea that, that the Chinese government could order Huawei to do something nefarious and they still felt like they could secure the network through their approach, right? And so that's at least an evidence-based approach to the whole thing. The other approach is sort of an ideologically based approach, right? Which basically says we can't trust China, we can't trust a company headquartered in China because of the nature of the Chinese regime. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that, that the only danger of that is that it, it can really, and has of course disrupted um, the deployment of 5G globally uh, and particularly in Europe. Right, right, okay, very good. Um, Steve Weber, professor at UC Berkeley. Um, so hi, Steve. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, everybody. Thanks again for the opportunity to join this good conversation. Um, agree with a lot of things Roger and Paul said, but I want to take a slightly different angle um, and start with 5G and then sort of expand from there. So, um, so when I think about the, the, the 5G, and I will say race, actually, um, we can argue about whether or not it's really a race. I, I, I think this is much more than a telecommunications network conversation because 5G is actually not about the traditional sort of conventional national security concerns about espionage and backdoors, um, whether those things are present or not. I, I think those are some of the easy headlines. And I think Roger pointed to that with regard to you know, Trump's phone and so on and so forth. 5G to me is a proxy for the competition over the control and use of data. And I'll call it you know, ambient data. Remember people used to talk about ambient computing. I think now we live in a world that's actually about ambient data. Uh, IoT in industry, IoT in transportation, IoT in day-to-day -day life. And of course, the competition about ambient data is fundamentally a competition about the, let's call it the, the, uh, the supply chain for machine learning and artificial intelligence. So that's really what we're talking about. And um, for me, it, it, it carries with it um, memories of the 2000s debate we had with regard to China around access to intellectual property. So that came up earlier and I wanna kind of use that analogy a little bit. Um, probably people remember the fights over uh, pharmaceuticals, music, video content, even earlier, 
software source code. Um, and in fact, um, we lived through those kind of intensive arguments and we saw this like really volatile mix of complaints about business models. How do you create and protect value when that stuff can move across borders so easily? I remember having a client, um, a, a manufacturing company that had uh, lots of facilities in China and we asked about like protecting the source code for their products or in this case, the IP behind their products. And the answer was, look, we, we just know we're gonna lose 10% of it a year and our business model incorporates that knowledge. So those were the kinds of conversations we were having about business models. There were ethical questions about what's fair. Um, for example, particularly when it came to the pharmaceutical sector, was it fair to hold back drugs because of pricing issues? There were the historical economic development questions, which I think Roger pointed to. Um, the US did exactly the same thing with regard to IP, um, promiscuity and copyright. There's this famous story about how Edgar Allan Poe came to the United States and found with surprise that all of his books were published and he had received absolutely no royalties from any of them. Um, there were security questions about reverse engineering and source code. And then fundamentally and most importantly, I think there were the innovation questions. And Roger made this point, I think really profoundly and I wanna repeat it. Um, when I was in grad school, we learned that a state led economy in a non-democratic country cannot innovate at the technological horizon mm -hmm. and is limited to playing catch up or fast follower, which is not really that big of a problem. And in some ways might even be advantageous to the United States. And I think as Rogers argued, the last decade has falsified that set of arguments for anyone who was looking closely. And that's a really, really profoundly destabilizing and troubling conclusion to come to. So let me sort of wrap that back to the 5G. I mean, each of those elements that I just referred to in the IP debates is already present and it's gonna be magnified in the US debate over 5G and the associated data race in the next phase. Business model for the telecom providers, obviously ethical questions that touch on, I'll call it, you know, the still emotive nationalism associated with telecom networks. I mean, it used to be every country had to have its own airline now we have this kind of emotive connection to our own telecom networks. The historical economic development questions, particularly about emerging economies, which have a point in arguing that they deserve access to the least expensive infrastructure build out they can possibly get, which is usually Huawei. And then of course, the core security questions, which are in the news really every day. And most importantly, ultimately the innovation questions about where the biggest uncertainty and lack of confidence lie. And I think Roger and Paul both pointed to that. So let me pose that last question sharply. I think the simple and the profound um, issue around 5G is, do we think of it just as kind of an enabling infrastructure with value add innovation that kind of sits one level or more up the stack. You know, Paul said Huawei is just a supplier of infrastructure for the telecom network. It's not an operator. Does that distinction matter? In that case, like an innovation friendly policy says, look, you know, just buy those inputs as cheaply as you can from wherever you can, it's a commodity um, and put your effort, energy and resources into building that stuff higher up in the stack. On the other hand, if you think of 5G as the foundation of a kind of integrated innovation system where ownership and control of that foundational operating system gives you an ongoing advantage in the ecosystem overall, then it's a very, very different story. And then you have to control that whole stack and you don't want someone else selling you quote, commodity infrastructure at the bottom. Now, I think today for many people in the United States, like the answer to that question, even if it's not posed explicitly is implicitly the latter. And I wonder, you know, if maybe we should stop and talk about that as a group. Um, as a provocation, let me put it this way. Um, data leaks and espionage backdoors might turn out to be the least important thing about 5G and Huawei. Um, I think this innovation substrate question could be the most important thing that we should be thinking about a couple of years from now. And it's a really fundamentally a question about where people's beliefs lie about where that line should be drawn. What is enabling commodity infrastructure? What is integrated foundation for the innovation stack? And the fact is, and I think this goes to Roger's point that we have a lot of work to do still, 
we don't know where that line really is. And that line moves over time. Um, I'm old enough to remember uh, the 1980s when we thought that commodity memory chips, that whoever led in commodity memory chips would lead the world. A decade later, you know, memory is treated as a commodity, low value at input that you just wanna get as cheaply as you can, wherever you can. And it may be that 5G network infrastructure moves in that way, um, the same direction over the, last, over the next couple of years. Um, let me end with one last point. Um, and I wanna, it, it's kind of a response to this argument Paul made about the Biden administration sort of not having a clear policy about what they think the end goal is and where they wanna go. I kind of disagree with that. Um, and so I wanna put that on the table. I think um, they are bringing a pretty deep strategic mindset and a discipline to the management of the relationship um, in a way that um, you know, some people like, might like, some people might not like, but I don't, keep, don't think you deny it's there. There's long-term strategic thinking, I think exemplified by people like Kurt Campbell at the NSC, um, Eli Ratner at DOD. Um, and I think what we're seeing come out of that, and Paul made many points in this regard, is a kind of whole of government approach to the competition, which we haven't seen for a long time. I mean, watching it, from the outside, it's quite impressive how quickly and how comprehensively this whole of government approach is rolling out. Uh, one of the areas that I watch closely is uh, IoT surveillance cameras that are sold to like homeowners, municipalities, school districts, hospitals. You know, reasonable people can disagree whether or not Americans should be allowed to buy any of these cameras that are made in China. And it's you know impossible to prove a negative if you start from the presumption that a surveillance camera made in China must have a security risk. We can debate that, but my point from the moment is, you know, you've got the NDAA placing one set of restrictions on that from the Pentagon. You've got the Commerce Department entity list placing another set of restrictions on that. And now just recently you have the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC weighing in and saying, you know, maybe we're going to uh, remove authorizations from existing cameras and maybe prevent authorizations from being made in the future. This is like a whole of government approach and now new bills introduced in the House and the Senate that would do exactly the same thing. So my point is that whether or not you agree with the goals, I think we are seeing a whole of government approach which is in some sense, I think strategically thought of almost like a whole of society competition, which is why there is a Cold War analogy at play. Um, it, 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 except it's not just government to government and it's not just, you know, uh, nuclear weapons competition or space race competition or other such things that are really being driven first and foremost by governments. It is a whole of society competition. And I think that's what the next decade is going to be about. Um, I hope we'll debate this a little bit. Um, I would argue just to finish up that this is a significant advantage for the United States, actually. Um, and that's just not a philosophical assertion about free societies and all that. It's actually a very practical one because in a whole of society and whole of government competition, that relationship is likely to be able to be managed and evolve. I think actually much more cooperatively inside Washington DC than it's going to be managed and how it's going to evolve in Beijing. And I think some of what we've seen even in the last week between the Chinese government and the large Chinese technology companies tells us a lot about what that's gonna look like. So let me stop there and uh, hope we can get into some of those issues. Yeah, no, that, that is true with uh, China clamped down on Chinese tech companies. And at the same time, the, the US is uh, doing some similar actions, at least with uh, antitrust. I think it's just um, the opposite though, but I, I, we can talk about that. <laughs> I think it's just the opposite conclusion. Okay, uh, let's get into it. Uh, Paul, uh, go ahead. I mean, where do you think this is all heading? Is Are we headed to this uh, decoupling world that everybody talks about of you know dual well, that's, standards? That's where I, I take issue with, with uh, I, I appreciate uh, Steve's comments, but I think I take issue with a couple of things. Cause I think the first the first thing is that, um, you know, that the strategy, there is, there is no real well articulated strategy. I mean, um, Kurt Campbell is not a China hand. Um, he, he's, he's a longtime Japan hand, knows a lot about Asia. 
Um, but but there aren't there aren't real strategists in the U.S. government to understand China, and the relationship with China is more is very complicated. Um, it's not like the cold. The big difference between the Cold War is there's huge interdependence. So in the middle of all this are China, U.S. companies, and many of those U.S. companies' success is because they've had access to the China market, for example. So disentangling sort of you know whole of society struggle um, here is really I think not 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 a particularly useful way to look at it because. Because you know, in in the middle of that are are lots of companies and lots of jobs and lots of innovation, right? I mean, the other issue is the extent to which U.S. companies and their innovation capacities have been uh, you know enabled or or or, um, or you know enhanced by having access to the China market. Um, and so, when you talk about the coupling, for example, one of the big issues is is the market outside of China, uh, you know, in the in Europe and in the U.S. and Canada, for example, is there enough capacity there? There to support, um, you know, technology companies and 5G operators um, uh, and 5G vendors, for example, as alternatives to China. There's a huge question about that, which nobody has really asked or run the numbers on. Um, and so I think the, 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 the issue of, uh, of sort of this zero sum game that, that's part of the, in some sense, part of this, uh, this, you know, Washington consensus and this idea of great power competition here sort of neglects um, the, 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 the tight interdependence um, of the U.S. and China in many areas, not just high tech, but in advanced manufacturing, for example. And so the question then is how deep the, is the decoupling that you're, that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. um, who's going who's gonna to support that? Um, and how deep is it going to go? And what's the impact going to be? Nobody's run, all I can tell you is nobody's run the numbers on the impact of that. And, and, this, and that, that's what I mean when I talk about um, a lack of strategy here um, in, in, from the Biden team, uh, at least so far, is nobody has run the numbers on this um, and said, you know, what's the real impact of this and how far do you want to decouple? <laughs> um, you know, it's because it's, 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 that, that's a huge question, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and it's, it's not a trivial one because, you know, China mm -hmm. is a $3 trillion advanced manufacturing economy um, mm -hmm. and many, many U.S. companies um, rely on that. Right. Um, in terms of the... Um, the, the other issue about about the, the China the recent what we prefer to call rectification um, and not a crackdown it's a rectification of, so, of of issues with Chinese tech companies across a whole number of sectors driven by different issues data security um, in the case of Didi but other antitrust issues in the case of Alibaba but really it's an effort to align the tech sector with Beijing's priorities and to gird itself for this competition with the U S no longer can China afford for example to have you know e-commerce companies competing uh, for, for customers and not actually investing in things like deep tech and innovation. These are the terms um, that people like uh, Vice Premier Liu He is using, hard tech. So they realize they're in a 10 year you know, struggle here to, 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 as the US cuts off access to Chinese companies that I mentioned earlier, um, particularly in semiconductors, that they need to really up their game here. And so that's the, the reason for some of the, the, recent, uh, the recent actions is, 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 is precisely to, to, because they can't, they're trying to de-risk across all these sectors, um, uh, their, 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 the potential exposure to, to, to US um, actions and also just to, to make sure that, that that investment in China is going in a direction that's going to optimize their their innovation capacity so they can compete in this in the in this uh, this competition. So um, I see this as sort of a, it's a natural evolution in, in their in their regulatory system. It doesn't mean they want to cut their companies off from U.S. capital markets. It just means that they can no longer afford to have certain kinds of uh, of business practices in China. Um, uh, driven by, by by particular kinds of companies and market forces, and they're and, and they're sort of you know rectifying that, um, and it's messy because U.S. In investors are are uh, are up in arms, but that's partly because the Chinese system can move very rapidly um, in the regulatory space when they want to. So antitrust, you know, wow, they move fast. The U.S. it would take ten years to do that, right? To do what they did to Ant, Ant, Ant Group, for example, um, and so uh, that's another thing that I think. Uh, People who, who who have lived and worked in China understand that you know when the signal comes from the top um, uh, to do something, then the system and the regulators can 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 jump into action. Um, and Roger knows this very well, and, and particularly in the data security side, which is, gets gets to another I think a very important uh, message that Stephen mentioned here, because data really is the, this big issue. And so the the crackdown or the the rectification of Didi and Full Truck Alliance and uh, probably now Tencent and other listed companies having to go through a cybersecurity review is because data is a big issue, and these companies are all handling 
huge amounts of data internally uh, to China and data is now a national security priority. And the US has, has done the same thing um, through CFIUS reviews of deals involving personal, the US personal data and the uh, new ICTS supply chain rule, for example, has a requirement for a review of transactions where there's a, uh, companies have 1 million or more users, which is exactly the figure that the Chinese uh, CAC rewrote its, uh, its, its cybersecurity review guidelines um, to, to match. So, you know, data definitely is a huge issue going forward here. And, 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 but I think the, um, I, I don't think that, um, that, that Chinese companies are, are, are going to be a big part of, 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 this, of this struggle. And I think that, um, you know, they're, they're up, Beijing is, is eager to get them all, all on the same page along with Beijing's priorities. Right. Well, given all these issues, do you think that China has the opportunity uh, to become a global tech superpower or a regional tech superpower? It's a question for everyone. But Paul, you could chime in. Maybe Roger should take this one. <laughs> I, I think we underestimate the extent to which it is already. Uh, because again, you know, uh, I think we very often underestimate the extent to which you know, when we talk about decoupling, what we really should be talking about is unscrambling an omelet uh, that has been sort of composed for the last couple of decades. So, you know, when you buy an iPhone, I'm sure that most people would see it as an American product. Uh, and certainly a lot of the design and programming work for it has taken place in Cupertino. Um, but the iPhone wouldn't have been possible without the logistical know-how and the manufacturing expertise that you get in China and which at least for the time being seems indisplaceable, uh, certainly for, for a company like, uh, like Apple. And even if it's possible, it's going to cost billions. But it isn't even that. It is also the fact that every iPhone and any other smartphone contains um, dozens of small improvements and innovations, for instance, at the level of material science, uh, the glass in the iPhone, for instance, being developed to break in a particular way, but also to scratch in a particular way so that you can, you can put it into your pocket next to your keys. A lot of the very boring underpinning work for that kind of extremely niche research takes place in China as well. And we privilege the Steve Jobses of this world and sort of the tech evangelist who sort of bring the story to the people. But the iPhone simply without China would not exist. Uh, and, and I think, you know, in the same way that I used to live in Britain before, that suddenly in the same way that we've all become, um, how shall I put it, uh, experiential experts in virology over the last year, you know, the Brits are now becoming experiential experts in the complexities of trade policy because through Brexit, they've exposed themselves to that level of unscrambling an omelet, a uh, slightly different omelet, but nonetheless. So, you know, the question whether China could become a tech superpower is essentially the, is essentially the question whether China could become like the United States. The answer is, of course, no, in the same way that the United States could never become like China. But together, they had created something where, you know, that, that created something that at least for a certain period of time worked. And that, you know, we, you know, there may be very good reasons for us to make it stop working. But as Paul already said, you know, at least let us think through what the consequences of, of that are going to be. Because this is, you know, the point about strategy is strategy isn't throwing around expensive think tank approved uh, slogans in the DC beltway. Strategy is identifying a goal, identifying a possible secondary goal if you can't meet your first goal. And then, and uh, both of these goals need to be feasible. Uh, and then you need to marshal the resources in order to achieve your goal at the least possible cost. Now, when I ask the question in Europe to governments and government officials, where do you want to be with regard to China in 10, 15 years? What is, an, uh, what is a future that you find both acceptable and feasible, right? What is realistic as well as doable? Um, then suddenly the soundtrack becomes one of crickets. Um, 
and you get very, very uncomfortable silences. Um, and I'm sure the same is true in the United States as well. Uh, that's my six-year-old coming to say hi to all of you. She, uh, uh, she, she wants to come and do a wave, do a wave. I, I, that's great. Can I just jump in quick? At, I, I second uh, Roger Roger's uh, comments. I just think a real practical example in answer to your question, Rebecca, is the semiconductor manufacturing space. So here, China has a real problem, which is that um, its companies that are competing in the semiconductor tool manufacturing sector, for example, and their companies that are manufacturing semiconductors are heavily, heavily dependent on US technology. And so to the extent that the US government, for example, and the Biden administration continues to strong arm the Dutch government to prevent um, ASML, the leading Dutch company and the lithography company from shipping a extreme ultraviolet lithography system to SMIC, which SMIC has contracted for, um, basically freezing China's domestic manufacturing, for example, at the between 10 and 14 nanometers, depending on, uh, on how you slice it. You could probably get down to seven nanometers for some uh, layers in the process, but it's very, very hard to do commercially. So China cannot, in, in that, in in other words, become um, a super a, a, a technology superpower without um, having a, a, a more a robust um, semiconductor manufacturing capability or having access uh, to to Western technology or to you know manufacturing in Taiwan or other places. So to that extent, um, the weaponization uh, by the U.S. government of the uh, semiconductor tool supply chain is, is a real constraint on China. Now, there are some will argue that that's gonna push China domestically. So in 10 years, for example, uh, with a real push to develop uh, their own you know, capability, that, that, that in, in 10 years time, they will come out of this you know, with a very strong, in a very strong position. But certainly in the short term, there's no way that they can overcome, um, for example, this cutoff of EUV equipment. Uh, there's just, there's no, path to, for example, advancing uh, uh, manufacturing advanced semiconductors um, below seven nanometers without having that EUV equipment. So they're sort of hamstrung here. Now I have argued uh, in, in, in other venues that, you know, for example, in, the, in looking at the global semiconductor shortage, that a, a potential national security strategy on the part of the US government, for example, that, that is more holistic and looks at the whole semiconductor sector as a sort of, as a sort of national security issue, you could make the argument that the US government should allow uh, that uh, ASML equipment to go to SMIC so that you increase capacity in the system and prevent these kinds of shortages that have already resulted in the loss of jobs in the US and the US uh, auto industry, for example. And you could take other measures to try to restrict the end user in China, for example, the military end users in China from obtaining certain semiconductors. Um, but you, you, but you, but just cutting off SMIC, for example, and again, that's another another policy that's never been articulated. What is the US government goal there in cutting off SMIC? Other than than uh, preventing them from, a, from manufacturing advanced semiconductors. It turns out that for most military applications though, you don't need advanced semiconductor manufacture, advanced semiconductors. You can use, most of them are between 14 and 20 nanometers. You know, they're, hard, they're radiation hardened, et cetera. The real cutting edge semiconductors used for HPC modeling, you could argue have a military, a more military application. Um, but again, that, that, none of that's been articulated by the, by the Biden administration or even in the Trump era. It was just, hey, let's deny China this most advanced equipment because we're concerned about China's rise as a technology right. power. That's right. about the extent of the articulation of the strategy there. So that's what I mean um, when, you know, when I talk about no strategy and that and not having a clear strategy there has implications that redound on the US. Um, in this case, uh, you could argue um, through the, right. the, the chip semiconductor shores costing right. jobs in middle America. Right. So without a clear strategy, are we just gonna see an escalation of these uh, US-China tech tensions? Um, or are there areas of cooperation or collaboration or, or are those a thing of the past? Steve? Yeah, so let me come in on that. I, I mean, obviously I, I take a slightly different view than Paul and Roger do of like the, let me put it this way, the willingness, the, ex, the expressed, and now I think over the last year or two, the demonstrated willingness of both sides to um, unscramble a surprising percentage of the omelet even though it's quite expensive to do so. Um, I agree that nobody has put a aggregate number on exactly what that would cost. Um, I think most firms with deep supply chains that go across the Pacific are doing as much as they can to estimate what it would cost for them individually 
to unscramble those supply chains in ways that um, that I think they are foreseeing as a, a real plausible move they would need to make. Um, I do think in, in some specific areas like in semiconductor production, we do have an estimate of what it would cost, for example, to do a kind of Semitech version two and substantially subsidize US semiconductor production back at home. Um, what it would cost, for example, for Intel to buy global foundries and consolidate the, those, found, those factories into one or those fabs. But I do think um, th the question that, that you asked, Rebecca, is, is, is something that um, we're not gonna see that evolution. Well, let me put it this way. The answer is not gonna become clear yet. I think that over the course of the next couple of years, um, the part of the strategy which says by identifying areas in which we actually really think it's in the best interest of the United States to do the couple. And let me be clear, I'm not endorsing that, just stating it. Um, that will leave other areas clear where in fact, some common interests can be identified and cooperative arrangements could be managed, for example, in carbon reduction or something like this. Um, I think that, that rhetoric sounds hopeful. Um, I remember hearing a great deal of it during the um, late days of the US-Russian Cold War. Uh, I think that, that, that you don't get to those conversations until you clear away some of the resistance and some of the, I'll put it, um, deep nationalist leanings on both sides around this process of decoupling. So although I think what the administration, my sense is that the administration would like both of those conversations to be going on in parallel, like over here, this is stuff we just cannot work with you folks on. And in fact, we're gonna decouple as much as we can. What that doesn't affect over here, we're gonna to try to find common interests and do those things together because it's in everyone's best interest. I don't think those conversations actually can be joined up yet. I think that you know, 2022, 2023, maybe they get joined up in a, in a more constructive way. But, but it's going to be a while. Yeah, no, I totally, and I totally agree with Stephen. I, I think that we've already seen rhetoric from Beijing basically saying, hey, you know, you want to collaborate on climate change, but then the rest of the, the whole rest of the, the relationship is going to be confrontational and competition. Um, you know, we're not sort of buying into that. So Beijing has already sort of basically said that that's, maybe that's a bit of a non-starter. So the challenge is to find some other areas. And that, that's where I think, for example, in the trade, the trade arena, um, I'm, a, I'm a little slightly more hopeful in the, in the, in the Trump era that the, the one thing that really worked was the Lighthizer Leo Ho relationship during the trade talks. There was a very professional uh, negotiation. Uh, Leo Ho brought a very competent team to that negotiation. There's a lot of res mutual respect between um, those two individuals and their teams. So, you know, in, in April, the heady days of April 2019, which seemed very, very long ago now, um, you know, there was, we were on the brink of, of some significant structural breakthroughs with China, opening up, you know, licensing around cloud services, which US companies, by the way, still care about. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, it, there was, a, there, there are examples of places where, you um, where there, 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 there could and there still could be, it has been and could be some cooperation and, and moving mm -hmm. and to address some of those really tough issues mm -hmm. uh, that were raised in the trade talks. But right now the political atmosphere is so toxic. Um, and you know, yeah. when, when Wendy Sherman goes to Tianjin, well, first of all, the, the Chinese make her go to Tianjin and not Beijing. Um, and then, um, you know, there's the US is continuing to sort of lecture and criticize Beijing at, at every turn, even though a lot of these issues are, are, are long known and we can't even get back to letting journalists go back into, into each other's right. countries or diplomats, right? They're, the Wall Street yeah. Journal used to have 20 people in China, they have two now. I think uh, New York Times has one. Now, is that a good thing for the, for the relationship over the long term? Probably not. Um, but we can't even, you know, these politically low cost things like reestablishing diplomatic presences in some of these consoles that were closed and letting journals back. And we can't even get, can't even get to that as sort of a goodwill yeah. gesture on both sides. So I'm a little oh, yeah. pessimistic that we're gonna see progress in the near term um, on the collaborative things. But I think, you know, climate change <laughs> is not gonna go away. So, um, you know, right. there, there's a huge need for collaboration on that and the pandemic. Sure, sure. More well, let's get to yeah. some questions for the audience here, because um, we do have several good ones in here about um, internationalizing the RMB since uh, the US dollar is so prominent in global commercial transactions. Um, is, um, should the Chinese, develop or internationalize the RMB so it becomes a higher priority for China and uh, how might China attempt to do this? 
It's not so, you know, I've been hearing that this whole delisting situation from uh, NASDAQ and NYSE uh, is uh, the kind of uh, push there is because they want the money coming back in to uh, their country, into Chinese territory. So what about this whole idea of internationalizing the r and It's not going to happen. Um, as I said, uh, the big problem that when you internationalize your currency is you lose control over it. Um, and you know, losing control over the uh, international valuation of the RMB is something that the Chinese government does not want at this point in time. Therefore, the RMB will not be internationalized. Uh -huh. you, know, you know, all this stuff with uh, companies listing in Hong Kong, this is not about monetary policy. It is about location of ownership, um, right? Uh, with, with, with Didi, Didi has, uh, Didi has north of 80% market share in ride hailing in China. Uh, we, we, we have to assume that most of the people using ride hailing in China will be, uh, will be the um, relatively more wealthy uh, spectrum of the Chinese population. There will be very senior officials, possibly military officials in there every so often. So suddenly, you know, you have a wonderful uh, thing to use, uh, a wonderful database of movements to use if you're an intelligence service and you want to take something up. That's the sort of stuff that you simply do not want to be owned. By foreign people. That's what a lot of the DD data stuff is about. Um, it's not about RMB internationalization. And I don't think we're going to see RMB internationalization because it would take away that which the Communist Party needs most to survive. Hmm. I offer a slightly different view on that. I, I, I agree that the um, conventional view of internationalizing the Yuan is sort of like a Kind of a competition to the US dollar, re replacing the US dollar as an international reserve currency. And we've been sort of having this conversation over the last couple of decades. And uh, uh, history and theory suggests that it is a much, much greater hill to climb than uh, people generally expect. But I think consistent with the way um, I've seen Chinese strategy on other issues evolve, Chinese understand that I think perfectly well and are looking for ways not so much to confront the dollar as to root around the dollar or the parts of the dollar's power and capacity that give the United States outsized influence. And in that context, um, I think the place to look um, is actually not so much at the traditional uh, renminbi or even at the capital markets per se, but it is at the central bank digital currency level yep. um, with uh, new innovative ways of creating essentially money um, as a particularly as a medium of exchange and a store of value that sort of roots around traditional institutions which kind of concretize American advantages like SWIFT and so on and so forth. So um, I, I would be watching what's happening with the People's Bank of China experiment with the central bank digital currency. I think the Federal Reserve has its eyes very closely on that experiment and has accelerated what the Fed is willing to do with its experiments coming up in central bank digital currencies. But that's where that battle is gonna take place. It's not gonna be like the dollar replacing the pound in the late right. 1800s. It's going to happen in the digital environment. Yeah, I would I would totally second that. I mean, we did, we've done a lot of work um, in that realm on the on the CBDC, uh, which is a pretty you know you could arguably China is way ahead on that in terms of central banks. They've been studying this. The PBOC has been studying this for seven years, and they're rolling this out very carefully. Um, lots of trials, working with Alipay and WeChat Pay, um, looking at cross border uh, issues in Hong Kong with the with the with the, with an e Hong Kong dollar, um, looking at um, cross border payments with uh, Thailand and and the UAE, and they published a white paper on this just last week on the CBDC, trying to be more transparent about the architecture of this and what it's trying to do, um, because the big issue with CBDCs will be interoperability. Um, because the design of these things really is critical. How they're designed, mm -hmm. do they use? Are they using blockchain? Are they using, you know, what sort of what's the actual mechanism? So I think Stephen is exactly right here. That that's where the issue is. But Chinese officials, retired PBS officials, talk about the CBDC in the context of eventual uh, RMB internationalization. So they're not sort of mutually exclusive. I think it, it, China. It would be natural over time that. That the RMB would be internationalized, but under what circumstances? And you know, there's lots and lots of issues around that. But I think yeah. the CBDC clearly shows that they're interested in pursuing a modern 
currency, programmable currency. Um, and, and next year at the Olympics, you know, I'm hoping to go to Beijing for the, for the, for the Olympics and have my, my digital RMB wallet on my smartphone and spend uh, digital RMB at the Olympics uh, because th that's, that's what they're gonna allow um, uh, uh, going forward here. So it's really an, an exciting and interesting space um, yeah. and, and, and China is really leading on CBDCs. Right, right. So here's a question from Canada, a very specific question about 5G and Huawei. Canada has yet to announce a formal decision on Huawei and its operations in Canada. So you have any advice for the Canadian government about this? Paul, um, I, I'm going to kick this one over to you, but I'll, I'll give you a minute to think about it by saying um, the approach of a zero trust architecture for telecommunications networks um, is a little bit um, hopeful, but it certainly is um, the holy grail and probably the right way to go. Uh, you talked about it, I think uh, maybe Roger talked about it as well in the context of what the UK government is trying to do. Um, I, if it were my decision to make, I, I want my telecommunications network to be the cheapest and most efficient possible infrastructure available. I don't care if I build it. I want my companies to be emphasizing building applications on top of that network. So I want to build zero trust architecture into the network um, foundational stuff. And then I don't care who owns it. Okay. Yeah, well, that's, that's um, again, that gets to my other, my point, which was that in some sense, you can build and architect a security uh, system on top of um, whatever the vent, whoever the vendor is, <laughs> whoever the, the architecture is. And, and in fact, the UK system is very forward leaning and looking forward to things like open radio access network and, you know, beyond to 6G, where all these issues are going to be really important. The security of the network is critical. Um, mm -hmm. And none of these problems are going to go away, regardless of who the vendor is. Um, and so that that approach, I think, is, is, is really important. But, you know, in the near term, the problem only problem with 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 Huawei and Chinese vendors, in particular Huawei, is there, you know, whether they're going to be able to continue um, uh, competing in this space if they can't manufacture cutting edge semiconductors in Taiwan, because 5G is, the, 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 the promise of 5G requires high, low latency, high bandwidth, and low power use. And to get to those three things, you need advanced semiconductors below the seven nanometer level um, as, part of your, uh, as part of your base stations, uh, for example. And so if Huawei can't compete in that space, then it, it's it's the, you know the issue will sort of go away to some degree because company mm -hmm. carriers will have to um, go with Ericsson or Nokia or Samsung or or, or Open RAN solutions uh, over time. Huawei has stockpiled a bunch of semiconductors, but I don't think they can I don't think they can you know weather that that that's a, a really critical issue that um, you know no carrier can buy you know second second uh, tier uh, equipment for their five G networks. Okay, so someone in the audience here has remarked that. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce has published a landmark report a month ago with facts and numbers showing thousands of U.S. jobs and incomes that would be lost with decoupling. Uh, any comment on that? Well, that just that's just that gets to my my it my the issue that really that nobody has really run the numbers um, and and only um, you know now are people sort of coming around to the idea that um, that you know somebody needs to really put numbers on the, on the decoupling yeah. problem. Um, yeah. Some There are some good think tanks uh, like, like Rhodium that have done some good work in this space yeah. um, and probably contributed to that uh, that report. Um, sure. But yeah, no, this is, a, this is a huge issue because again, it gets to yeah. sort of what's the strategy, how far does the decoupling go? Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, what's this, where's the sort of landing zone here right. Um, right. in terms of decoupling? Right. So broader uh, perspective question on Outlook. Where do you think China tech is going? And uh, so one of the audience questions was uh, particularly the semiconductor market, but overall China tech in so many sectors today and it's risen so rapidly um, and uh, things are changing very swiftly. Where do you think it's all going? Is uh, where, do you, where do you see China tech in 10 years from now? And well, also related to that, are we going to see peace between these two superpowers since we're in this, you know, peace and diplomacy institute here? Are we going to see peace or are we going to see more conflict? The two broad problem. questions. Well, so define peace. But one thing that I would like to highlight is, um, you know, we've been talking very much China-US, uh, yes. slightly more China-Western. Uh, uh -huh. 
you know, we're forgetting about two thirds of the global population. And surprisingly, uh -huh. these people are also real people uh, with yeah. real needs and real hopes and aspirations, um, right? So th this is the problem, you know, when we're strategizing from the United States, it's almost like, you know, we think about, or, we, or more broadly the West, we think about what we want Beijing to do or which way we want Beijing to jump. And we already forget that Beijing has agency and that Beijing might respond using its own, you know, logical thought capability. And then we don't even take into consideration the rest of the world. Think about this. Major Chinese tech companies have developed in surroundings of substandard infrastructure, of a customer base with low purchasing power growing, but China still is only a middle income country, of uh, political capriciousness, government capriciousness, mm -hmm. in situations where much of their supporting architecture uh, they had to build themselves, right? Compare Amazon, when Jeff Bezos wanted to sell books and wanted to people to pay for them, which you know is a fairly handy thing if you're going to be in e-commerce. All he had to do was sign an agreement with Visa and MasterCard and he was in business, right? Mm -hmm. A company like Alibaba had to invent their own yeah. payment system. Uh, yeah. To a certain degree, they've invented their own logistical systems. So these are companies that are tremendously experienced at operating in the less luxurious uh, surroundings of developed countries. Yeah. Guess who's in prime position to connect the next billion? And I think that's where you're going to see Chinese technology firms really going, right? Growth, China's traditional growth model is make cheap stuff, put it in boxes, send it to the US, send in Europe, do that 10% more every year on a value basis, yeah. right? Those days are over. That's not where growth is going to come from. Go growth is going to come from the next billion. The next billion of people that are going to join the, mobile uh, the, the global middle class, they're going to have smartphones, they're going to want to have value added services running on top of that, those smartphones, they're going to need connectivity infrastructure, in time there's going to be things like connected vehicles, internet of things, my hunch is that's where the Chinese tech sector is really seeing growth in the street. And if you don't want to take my word for it, uh, the Chinese Ministry of Commerce just the other day released a, 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 a released guidelines for foreign investment by Chinese tech companies. And that's pretty much the direction they're going in. Um, I've translated them and they will be uh, public on DigiChina in the next day or two as our editors uh, get through that translation. And I can uh, assure you that Roger is one of the finest translators of Chinese technical regulatory documents out there. I've worked very closely with him on this. And it's a, it's a, it's a particular skill. Let me add one, one, one thought. I, I agree very much with what Roger said, and I agree with Paul's assessment of the value of Roger's work, which we all use. Um, but to add an, an additional thought, uh, I, I, I think, it, it, I think uh, where he's trying to take headed, I I'm not gonna address quantum computing, I'm not gonna address high-end supercomputing, but I I'm simply gonna address the part of the market where we still, I think many Americans have this presumption, sometimes unstated, um, that Chinese companies cannot build global brands, cannot build customer facing products that are of great excitement to Western audiences. And I think the counterfactual to that is staring us all in the face, and it is called TikTok. Yep. And it's not going to be the last one. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I get all my intel on TikTok from my son, my, my best friend's 12-year-old son, who's a big user. Yeah, it, it certainly is a sign of where... Uh... China tech has gone global and had a global uh, impact. Uh, it's, also yeah. a of, yeah. it's, it's also a sign of- Double down on the point, the largest growth um, sectors, you look at the profit report, the earning reports coming from Facebook, from Snap, from others, um, Reels, I believe it's called on Instagram. I mean, every American communication, social media platform has in the last six months created a TikTok clone. Those oh, yeah. are the fastest growing parts of those businesses. It oh, yeah. is exactly 180 degrees of what we expected. 
with regard to American products being copied by the Chinese. Oh yeah, definitely the reverse is happening today. Um, we Can I make one, one? Yeah, go ahead. One Paul. quick comment in answer to your question, Rebecca. Great question. I think one area that people uh, have maybe not to focus on is just that China has right now deployed, I think, eighty percent of the global 5G base stations that have been installed. So um, I, would, I would expect there to be lots of innovation on top of that, that infrastructure because the problem with 5G is you sort of need a critical mass before you can start innovating on that. And China, more than any other country globally, uh, I would argue, ha has that infrastructure and is pushing 5G into areas like mobile edge computing um, at, the, at the sort of factory uh, campus level. Um, and so I would expect to see uh, Chinese companies, including the big players like Alibaba and Tencent and other many, many other um, second tier unicorns that you've never heard of be, be you know, piling into that space and innovating on top of that 5G network. And then of course, um, you know, getting some first mover advantage. And there's a big argument over, the, over whether, you know, the US, which is well behind on deploying 5G uh, systems, whether that's gonna be, a, you know, ultimately a, a big problem because the US has so much uh, uh, innovative capacity, for example, among its leading companies. So, but I think China is gonna be a big player in that space. And then they will ex that they'll export those applications and companies um, into other areas where the, the infrastructure is largely Chinese built like Africa and Latin America and other places. Mm -hmm. So getting back to my question of more peace or conflict, just to wrap things up, everybody just give a quick answer, which way are we leaning? If we're lucky, we're going to get the regular brush, uh, the regular brush fires that are going to make sure that the enormous conflagration doesn't happen. Uh, I think, I, I, you know, this and this really is a problem with cyber. It's that sort of slightly unreal tinge to it. Um, in the security, uh, in the security studies world, people have come to call it a permanent state of unpeace. So it's not uh -huh. peace. It's not peaceful, but it's also not conflict. Okay. And, you know, part of the problem is just the fact that technology exposes us a lot more to each other. It creates a far greater contact surface and therefore a far greater surface for potential friction, mm -hmm. right? Once upon a time, country, you know, these were countries far away of which we knew little that weren't worth the bones of a single Pomeranian grenadier. Whereas now we're always in everything grinding up uh, against one another. And so, yes, uh, more brush fires, but hopefully no conflagration. Okay. I, I would just add, um, I'm really worried about sort of an accidental, you know, slide into conflict. Um, I, in, in my many years in the US government, I did war gaming, uh, spent some time war gaming on China and it always ended badly <laughs> um, because you quickly escalated to nuclear conflict. So yeah. I'm concerned that over Taiwan, you know, we could, it could be an accident, an overflight, um, uh, or, or just again, pushing China into, into, into a corner that, that causes the, them to, to react in ways that the U.S. may not may not uh, like, um, mm -hmm. and so that's that's the concern. And then cyber is the other area where Joe Biden, I think, just a couple of days ago, said that you know the potential for cyber conflict to spill into the real world with, and he specifically mentioned Russia and China is real. Mm -hmm. So again, another another mm -hmm. inadvertent potentially uh, issue where a cyber operation goes awry and kills people, um, and then we're sort of off to the races. So those are the two the two mm -hmm. risk areas: Taiwan and cyber. That I think um, we need to watch closely. Okay, Steve, final yeah, comment? Very, yeah, just very briefly, Paul, I, I agree. Um, I think the attention we're paying to those potential inadvertent escalation pathways is a good thing. Um, but I wanna double down on what Roger said about brush fires here in Northern California, we call them controlled burns. Um, they're safety valves, they're like pressure valve, pressure release valves. And I think that's exactly what we're going to see. Some of it will be a little bit orchestrated and almost feel a little bit ritualistic. And some of it will happen in places we probably don't expect, perhaps even in parts of the Middle East. But I don't expect that to get much, much, much worse. All right. Very good. Let's wrap it up there and uh, thank our panelists, Rajay, Apal, and Steve, uh, and also uh, Arta and the whole Institute uh, for bringing us all together. I uh, really appreciate it and all the great questions. Sorry we didn't get to all of them, but uh, we got to a, a lot of them. So I hope we answered uh, many of your questions. So, okay. Um,
I think we'll be wrapping it up now. Thank you for, thank for you. a great job in moderating, Rebecca. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you to our distinguished panelists for the excellent discussion. Again, the recording of this discussion is available on IPD's YouTube channel. So go there, and if you want to share the link with your colleagues, you can find it on YouTube. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.